Hey there, and welcome to our midweek service. My name is Sam Markham. I'm one of the associate pastors here on staff at Cornerstone SF, and I'm excited to be able to share this time with you tonight. So as has been our pattern, we're going to be going back into our archives and grabbing a message series called Restart. And it's a New Year series, and so we'll find a lot of the things that are shared will apply to what we're going through just because of the time of the year, but also, as God often does, there, there's some nuggets in there that just, it seems uncanny that this was shared back in 2016, but so much of it applies to what we're walking through right now. And the message that we'll look at tonight is actually entitled, A Holy Life. And in it, Pastor Terry will set up by kind of posturing the, the opportunities we have as we start a new year, but in particular, looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians and how he outlined the, the benefit and some of the characteristics of living a life that is holy unto God. So let's check it out and I'll circle back at the end with a few thoughts. So um, I was mentioning that uh, this last year, this last year is certainly has been a bit of a journey for me, just even with my voice, and it's one of the reasons why I have to go really slow here. So I only have one message to share, and this is the arrow that is being shot, and wherever it goes, God chooses to take it. May it bring life. But speaking of restart, I think I I, I really love the new year because to me it speaks of a new opportunity. It seems like a fresh start, kind of a restart. Uh, this last week, just to be also candid, not to be a bummer, but I got so sick. Uh, I, caught, I caught a cold from one of our pastors. I won't name their name, because, uh, <laughs> but um, he's sharing after me. I, I won't, but I won't mention who he was. But I was, I was absolutely, I don't know if that's 100% true. I really don't know how I caught it, but I know all of our pastoral staff was sick. But I was miserable. And uh, it just, you know, as I sat there as the year was ending, uh, com coming off the Christmas Eve services and that week, that gap week, I just thought, man, this is, this, it just tied a ribbon uh, on what had been for me and many of us, but for me personally, a very difficult year at a number of levels, in all truthfulness, it's been the most difficult. I just, I don't, I'm not a person who exaggerates. That's not my normal tendency. But it's been, without a doubt, the most difficult and challenging year of my life, certainly in my ministry life, but I think in my life, period. And so that, what I'm saying is, I am so glad for a restart, right? <laughs> and for me, this is part message and part pep talk. And it's about getting our mindset right. It's about um, shifting our perspectives. It's inevitably, the Christian life is going to have seasons and, it's, well, it's going to have struggles. And it's going to have times of breakthrough. It's going to have ups. It's going to have downs. It's going to have seasons of regress, seasons of progress, seasons of stress, seasons to address things that God is calling us to take a look at with fresh eyes. And so that's part of what we want to do. So let's start this uh, year's journey into the Word together as a people by looking at a passage of Scripture from one of the great books of the New Testament, Paul's magnificent epistle. That's a letter that he wrote to the Ephesus. It's called Ephesians. If Ephesus was a church in Greek, in Greek at the time, of New Testament times, and uh, it's, this letter is magnificent, especially in the way that it opens up. And he says this, these words, and you can see this Scripture which we've placed in the handout as well. Grace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. There's a lot going on here. And we could spend a lot of time just sitting with all these superlative, expansive statements. But look at the final phrase, because that's the one we really want to emphasize. We're calling this opening message a holy life. And, and look what Paul says here. He says that we should be holy and blameless before him. And it's that holy peace that we really want to focus upon. In his most technical term, this passage, just look at it, try to look at it one more time. He's, Paul is reminding us of how Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, makes it possible for you and me to be accepted and set apart to God in spite of our sinfulness, our brokenness, our lack of purity, which is essentially what holiness is, purity. For when we say that God is holy, what we're saying elementally, at least essentially at some level, he is utterly pure, utterly good. He is light, as Jesus described him, in whom there is no darkness at all. There is no inner conflict in God. There is no turmoil. There is no evil. No contradiction. He is love. He is light. He is life. Now we, on the other hand, though made in his image and at some level as human beings bearing his markings, hence we have the capacity to love. We have the capacity to worship. We have the capacity to be kind. There are certain things that are unique to human beings that the rest of the animal kingdom do not possess. It's because we were made uniquely in the image of God. Even in our brokenness, there's a part of us that reflects that. And oftentimes when we are at our best, we may see it. But I will say this, we are both at our core, um, well, we're just, we're not, we're not whole. Um, I'm going to say something that some of us might initially recoil back from, but I, I believe when we really are presented with God, there is a part of us that is both drawn to him and a part of us because of our nature that is repelled by him. And I just, I'm going to suggest that, that even though we're made in his image, we're marred by sin and willfulness, so we're capable of great love as human beings, and we're also capable of great evil. Uh, we're capable of amazing kindness. We're also capable of almost just extraordinary selfishness. Bottom line, we're not born holy. We need a savior. At least that's one of the reasons why we do. But another way of thinking about being holy, since that's the term we're trying to focus on, is not just about what God does for us in Christ positionally so that we can be accepted by him, but it's also something he desires for us to pursue. I've got to lay this groundwork. If I don't do it, the other piece won't work. And, and so it's both something he does for us in Christ and something he calls us to pursue in our own lives. And as a result, it's actually the perfect groundwork as we talk about living a life of faith and a growing life of faith in this new year. And so holiness is both something that God does for us. He makes us holy in Christ and something he calls us to pursue. You see that? He does for us and calls us to pursue but here's the key. He calls us to pursue it from a particular perspective. And that perspective is the perspective of the love of Christ. So it's both something God does for us, something he calls us to pursue, but something he calls us to pursue from a particular perspective, which we know and consider to be and can identify as the love of Christ. Now, let me pull back one more, one more layer. <clears throat> <clears throat> the word holy, which the apostle is using right here in this passage, it, this is usually a word we tend to associate with the Older Testament. At least I do, and I think most people do. In the Old Testament, where it speaks of moral and ceremonial purity. In fact, it's one of the key themes for the, the third book of the Bible, Leviticus. And things don't get much older than, than that. I mean... 
Leviticus is the book where good intentions to read through the Bible in a year go to die. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's the graveyard. It's the graveyard of a good start. I, it's like somewhere along the way, I'm going to read through the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, yeah, you know, Egypt, Moses, Leviticus. Wow. I mean, you're talking about like intricate details and it's, everything bogs down. Mo a lot of people quit in Leviticus, right? <laughs> and um, one of the key themes in Leviticus is holiness. And so, I, and I guess on top of that, just even in terms of our own contemporary vernacular, holiness is not a word that we use a lot. And, we, and, it, and when it is used, it's usually used in a pejorative manner. It's, it's just, you know, it's, as a concept even, it feels a little bit clunky in just terms of where our culture is at. It seems outdated, like a, like a jacket or a piece of clothing from another era. Not retro, not cool, you know, not like, oh, wow, that's so old, it's cool. No, more like, more like just antiquated, like something we pull out of our grandparents' closet that smells like mothballs, maybe, you know? That, that, that's what I'm talking about. And in a highly secularist culture like ours, you just hear this, where many want, and this is true, many want religion and Christianity in particular pushed into the closet and into the hinterlands of cultural expression. This is a word, this word holy, that carries a particularly unique kind of baggage I would, I would guess that a few, more than a few of us, when we walked in thinking, oh, I wonder what the New Year's message is going to be about, and saw a holy life, went, oh, a holy life. Well, hope it's interesting. You know, I mean, my mind, my mind ho holiness, we're going to see, it's something that a lot of times speaks of, in people's minds of joyless kind of self-righteousness. A lot of times when we think of the word holy, we, holiness, extreme religiosity, um, old-fashioned, backward, puritanical expression. It isn't cool to talk about being holy, yet alone about committing ourselves to pursuing it. And yet the Bible is clear about its value. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present. So what is the holy life? What are we talking about? You know, what, what do we mean when we say, we should pursue this as a priority. Why are we even starting the year out laying this as a groundwork piece? You know, why are we beginning the year with this? I'm going to say this, and I'm going to try to... A holy life, as it's being described here, is essentially a devoted life. When we think of devotion, a devoted life is always anchored in the love of Christ. The Apostle Paul, who wrote these words in Ephesians was a man who was raised. He was not always a follower of Jesus. In fact, there was a period in his life where he hated Jesus. I mean, he hated Jesus. And he hated anybody who followed him. But the Apostle Paul was a man who was raised in the Older Testament. That was his scripture. That was his worldview. That was how he, how he framed his understanding of God. He was dedicated. He was devoted. But he always felt guilty. He struggled with it. He had law-based holiness morality. And law-based holiness morality tends to focus, hear me, on suppression. But when he came to know Jesus as his Savior and literally was apprehended by him, as he called it, captured in his love. When he came to know Jesus as a Savior, he really saw for the first time that there was actually a higher law that he saw. He said it was the law, the love of Christ, the love in Christ. And it moved him from a, a, a law-based holiness morality to a love-based holiness morality that was less about suppression. Now, I know this is not making sense to everybody, but for those who can hear it, it was less about suppression and more about alignment and cultivation. Here's the deal. One approach to holiness and morality is like pushing down a cork. The more we push the harder it gets to hold it down. The other is like growing a beautiful garden. Listen, it still involves taking out the weeds. It does. 
and anybody who tries to sell us a bill of goods that you can have a beautiful garden, but you have no responsibility to take out the weeds, they're selling us a different version of what Jesus taught. But the fact of the matter is, there is some truth to this. The focus is not on the weeds. It's on trying to grow and protect. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because, by the way, I'll, I'm, I'm going to be very candid here. For a vast majority of my Christian life, certainly the early part of my Christian life, I did not understand this. Because I was raised by amazingly devoted people who loved Jesus, but they tended to focus more on the weeds than on the cultivation of the garden. The difference is that we need to, if we're going to really understand what holiness is, it has to be viewed less about the weeds and more about the goal of cultivating the beautiful garden. The, the, that's where the focus needs to go. So at its core, if I could put it this way, holiness is about what God both does for us and desires to do in us, it's, but it's something that flows best out of a comprehension of his extravagant and relentless love for us. Now watch what we're going to read next, because what, we're, what we read next, which is Paul's continuation of this thought, expresses this exactly with great clarity. Go to the passage there. You can see it also. I'm reading from the uh, third chapter, verse 14. I'm going to read through it fairly quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of, of His glory He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Stop right there for a moment. I'll do one quick move. What happens on the inside is the key. Always. That's where the real battle is. The external, Jesus said, always is a result of what's internal. If we nurture the garden inside, then we're going to bear the right fruit. Out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus said, make no doubt about it, the, heart's, <laughs> the mouth speaks. It speaks what is there. The mind, the heart, this is what we're talking about, the inner being. This is where God really wants to get at things because this is where battles in terms of our own personal growth in Christ and our ability to break through areas that are pinning us down. The real growth occurs from the inside. That's where the Spirit wants to go to help us. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded. Now watch this. Watch the flow. Watch the, the expansiveness of the description, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, with all those who are called, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen, which means let it be, let it be so. So there it is. What is he saying? It's our comprehension of the love of Christ, understanding just how much we, he loves us, that is meant to per, really compel us to pursue the growing life, right? The abundant, holy, and pure life. Again, love-based holiness, not law-based, not about suppression, but cultivation, not about weeding as much as growing the garden of our soul. Practically speaking, now we shift. Practically speaking, a couple of quick thoughts up there. This has to do with cultivating a life that is nourished in the love of God. So as we begin to think about our year resolutions, goals, and the initiating of healthy habits, which we inevitably do at the beginning of the year, I think the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit that the most important thing we probably can do at the outset of this year is to reinforce that we are at our best, our most holy, when we are most immersed in the love of God. It's what Paul was pointing at when he prayed that the Ephesians would learn how to be rooted in the love of Christ. Now look, we may not know or be able to control that I know for sure this is true, what our year is going to bring. Some of us, look, if some of us knew what last year was going to bring to us, we might have said, I'll pass. <laughs> That's me. I pass, I pass. A lot of us might. Others might have started jumping for joy. Oh my goodness, what a year. They, 
here's the thing. Not every year that starts out great ends, ends great. Not every year that starts out poorly ends poorly. There's a lot of twists, turns, ups, downs, valleys, mountains. Who can tell what is going to happen? We have to walk humbly. We are not God. We don't see around the bend. That's one of the reasons we're to live day by day. We can make our plans. We can lament our past. But we need to live day by day. Give us this day our daily bread. When we, get too, when we start dwindling back and we start pushing too far ahead, we lose our focus. This is the day the Lord has made. I will be glad in it. I will rejoice in it. By your grace, Lord, help me to do that. So what Paul is doing here is he's, he's pointing toward a transcendent principle, isn't he? And that transcendent principle is that a life that is rooted in the love of God is a life that will flourish. Hear me, loved ones, it's going to flourish even in the pain, even in the questions, even in the struggle, even, even in the prosperity. If it's rooted in the love of Christ, I mean deeply rooted, it can go through anything. Paul said, I've learned to be content. I mean really content. I, can know, I, know, how to, I know how to prosper and not forget God, not loosen my commitments. A lot of times people get blessed. They get a new promotion. They get some type of, of, a, of a breakthrough. And all of a sudden, the walk with Christ is diminished. Other times, some of us find that we get these enormous troubles. And it, it, it like concentrates what's really important in a way that never, would never happened before. So not all gain is gain and not all loss is loss. So how do we root ourselves in the love of Christ quickly, okay? These are practical, but it's where I was at, so I'm going to share them. One, by staying in his word. And I'm talking about relational investment here. Because you can't know somebody, you can't grow intimate with somebody, you can't say into me, see with anyone if we never talk and share and listen deeply, honestly, authentically. We're talking about reading his word. We're talking about meditating and reflecting, spending time. That requires time choices. Um, Psalm 1, the great opening psalm. You know, blessed is the man, the man, the woman who walks, you know, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of those who scorn the ways of God. But his delight put that up there. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In that law, they meditate day and night. They're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, brings forth its fruit. In its season, its leaf also doesn't wither, right? Whatever it does, it's going to have success in it. There's a truth to that. You're going to prosper. The idea is to build the habit of cultivating a love for the word. Okay, I'll say it this way. Cultivating a love for his word that allows his word of love to work in us. Cultivating a love for his word that allows the word of his love to work in us so that we can become anchored and rooted. For me in this last season of, of, of suffering, and maybe, maybe somewhere down the line I'll share a little more in depth around that experience. I don't think I have enough of a vantage point yet to do it. But during that period, I can share you that, with this, that there, it was a very dark period for me, difficult and during that time of suffering, his word became, a, I only share this to help any of us who might feel that sometimes, it became a refuge for me. I mean, I lived in the first 50 Psalms. It was an altar of tears. I, I brought before him, I wrote his promises down. I struggled to claim them as my own. Journaling, I journaled a lot. Journaling is something that some of us may really want to do seasonally. Some people do it through the year. But when you're walking through something, to be able to journal, and I journaled a lot, write out your prayers. Write out your laments. Just write them out. Write out hopes for deliverance. Declare, I, you know, during that time, I declared my desire to learn the lessons he was trying to teach me, clarified my heart, asked him to help me submit my attitude, tried to be as raw and real as possible. And that's what pain will do to you. Pain pulls away pretense. 
because you can't pretend when you're hurting. And the thing is, when we do that, what we find is that God will meet us. God really does. He will meet us there as we allow his word. A lot of times just writing his word out. I mean, that's a great thing to do. You find something you're reading, write it out. Just like write it out. So you, one other thing, and I'll talk more about this a little bit later, down in the coming weeks, is to, is to even pick a seasonal verse and commit it into your heart and then let it just penetrate. Okay, secondly, retraining our, our self-talk. The reality is we're often our biggest enemy. Too often we speak motivation to ourselves. Actually, we, we, we speak to ourselves in ways that greatly discount it how God sees us or what he can do. Um, and if you're a negative self-motivator, that doesn't do work great. It doesn't. Sometimes it's, we, we speak negatively, critically. We self-deprecate. We, we, we allow our attitudes to be conveyed to others. Um, sometimes because of things we've done, sometimes it's because of things that have been done to us, scripts we've had spoken to us, scripts we've come to believe about ourselves. This is where we need to challenge ourselves to confront these verbal habits and tendencies. This is where the love of Christ comes in because he wants to get into this and say, well, that's just how I am, or that's just how my family is, or that's just how I am when I'm under pressure. And, and that may be true, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't want to help us grow through that and shift that around because sometimes what we're doing is really hurting us. Thirdly, cultivate a life of prayer. And for me, that speaks of honest communication. Write out the prayers. Speak out the prayers. Again, sharing that in my own life, for me, I asked him to reassure me of his love. I believed he loved me. Even if I felt perhaps I was being chastened, or at least I was not being delivered the way I wanted to be delivered when I wanted to be delivered. And you understand what I'm saying. It's like, I love you, Lord. I was sitting in a, I was getting my hair, hair cut. And I was sharing a little bit with the, the person who was cutting my hair. And then in front of everybody on the floor, he, he asked me, I have a real honest question to ask you. And he said it out loud, which kind of was good. good. He said, did you ever feel like God let you down? And I said, <laughs> it was a good question. <laughs> I, I looked and I looked around and, I, and I, I said, man, that's a good question. I said, and me personally, I did not. I feel like he owes me nothing beyond what he, could, he has already given me, way beyond what I deserve. The last person I want to make my enemy is the Lord. He is my best friend. I may not understand what he's doing or why he's not doing something, but his love, I do not question. I would more rather question myself and perhaps see it as something that God is trying to teach me. No question, there's things that are to be learned. And we could, there's a lot of th ways we can go with a conversation like that, but I want to suggest that the Lord, he invites us to places where he, he may not answer the question the way we want. He may not deliver us, but he will give us his reassuring touch. There were times where I felt him say, I am with you in your pain. Learn of me. Wow. Prayer helps us gain peace and perspective. Okay? And last two things I'll say in, about the holy life and I have to say them fairly quickly. It, it, it comes, it really, the holy life is also building on, building on the foundation of his love. This one has to do with nourishment rooted in his love. And the second one has to do with and being built in his love. A building that is built, okay, I'll, I'll say it this way, it's New Year's. Think of our life as a building. There are additions God wants to make in our house. There may be certain rooms he wants deconstructed. There may be some new construction he wants to begin. There may be some cleaning that needs to be done. There may be a room that he wants redecorated. In Proverbs, there's a great verse that says, you know, through wisdom, a house is 
you know, built, and its rooms are filled with rare and precious treasure. So God wants sometimes just pondering, Lord, what is it that you want to do in a particular room of my life? Are there things that you want to, to create in there that haven't been? Maybe that becomes the goal, one room to be decorated and filled. What would that look like? How do I begin that process? I, a lot of, I will tell you one thing. It, it's usually going to involve other people. That's what we talk about, small groups. That's why we talk about serving on a ministry team. Because it's out of those places where friendships that have a Christ-centered focus occur and where we begin to gain the potential to have actually an even deeper level of friendship, which is an accountability person or two, that has the freedom and trust and love to challenge one. We have the trust to challenge one another to, to grow and to, to take a look at what we're building. Lastly of the lastly, here it is, all right? Let's be open to the new things that God wants to do this year. He can do, what does Paul say? Rooted, rooted nourished in his love, grounded, built. These are keys to the holy life. And then what? <laughs> he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can even think or imagine. Now, I was listening to someone share with me how they just felt like the year had gotten off to such a bad start. And they were saying why God was letting, letting them down and... Uh, you know, this is I'm never going to change, and oh, this is my situation. And I had no, I had no stone to throw. I just loved them. But the fact of the matter was, we are underestimating God. We don't need to articulate um, what God can't do. We need to, we need to articulate what God can do. And God can do amazing things. God can turn things around. God can, sh God can take a defeat and bring it, and bring our greatest victory in life. God can take the greatest crushing in our life and make, and make it the most beautiful aroma that allows other things to grow. He can take things that are bad and literally they become building blocks of an entirely new breakthrough place in our lives. We are not to underestimate God. We are to welcome him in to our places. So let's start by saying, Lord, I'm open to the new year and what you want to do in it. I really am. I am. I can't wait. Bring it on, Lord. Make it a good thing, please. And if not, make it a good thing in the bad thing. Either way, it's going to be okay because I have you and you have me. Let's pray. All right, Lord, we've just tried to lay a groundwork for you. We tried to give our, our honest words for you to help us with, and we thank you. You call us to a place of devotion, a place of holiness, but always girded with the idea of love the love of Christ. When we're safe there, if we're safe there, then we have no fear. <laughs> oh, the fears. Perfect love casts out fear. You tell us in 1 John 4, where are our fears? Bring your love in those places. Settle us there, Lord. I will not be afraid, for the Lord is with me. What can man do to me? So, Jesus, be, it, be with us. Be our front and rear guard. Bless us. Take us into deeper places. Root us more in your love. Build us on the foundation of that love and extend us out to have more faith, to be open to real possibilities that the gift that this new year brings us. Either way, good or bad, you've got good to give us. I thank you for it. I bless you for it. In Jesus' name, I pray for it. Amen. Man, that was so good. And so much of that message could have been written specifically for 2020 and the things that we just walked through. And one of the things that a challenging season does is it reveals how well provisioned we are for facing the inevitable hardships and challenges of life. You know, if we've stored up the things of character and optimism and faith, we can walk through seasons of hardship without being too rocked when those inevitable challenges come. But it's worth noting that there are also times where no matter how well provisioned we thought we were, our resources are going to be wiped out. We're going to feel depleted and we have to kind of start rebuilding from the ground up. And so whether we're walking into 2021 feeling relatively filled with joy and hope or whether we are feeling depleted and needing to, something to help get us out our heads back above water, the best thing we can always do is building or rebuilding our foundation on the Word of God and the love of God. 
The beginning of the year is a great time to start a much needed change and adjustments to how we organize our lives. For some of us, this might be finding a Bible reading plan. A number of us just started a Bible in a year reading plan through the YouVersion Bible app. And if you're interested in joining us, go ahead and email me at sam at cornerstonesf.org. You can ask for that in the chat. Uh, if you didn't get that one, I just said it, or if you want to look online, you can find me online as well. But I'd be happy to, to join you to the group of us that are going through that this year. And a Bible in a year plan typically is about a 10 to maybe 15 minute time of reading God's word. And then the plan we're doing has a little space to record maybe one thing that stands out and you can share that with the group of people that are going through it. And these kind of things are always, it's always good to have somebody else who, who's journeying with us, you know, whether it's just one or two people maybe, or a group of us like we're doing, uh, just to provide that extra motivation, encouragement, and maybe even another vantage point for what's being shared or, or somebody who's been walking with the Lord a little bit longer to add some, some experience perspective, or maybe somebody who's newer in their faith journey, sharing some fresh eyes on how God's word is speaking to them. And for others of us, it may be an opportunity to add a, a devotional time to our daily walk. We have the, the Rise and Shine video devotions that Pastor Terry does that, that go out Monday through Saturday. And, and so it's just a great way to, to start those six days of the week. And then we have the weekend message on Sunday as well. So each day has that opportunity to, to get a little bit of his word and, and to apply that to our lives and just to keep building steadily on the word of God. Others of us may want to start a pattern of journaling, as Pastor talked about, uh, or maybe adding a, a time of prayer to our lives. And I, I do encourage you maybe to, to ask God for what one thing to start with. Sometimes we can be overambitious and, and add too many things and we try to do all these new things at once and, and we end up just losing steam because it's, it's hard to add a lot of change all at once. And others, others of us don't know where to start and so we just don't try anything. And so let's try to find maybe one thing to start out with. And any of those suggestions could be good or maybe it's something else. And, and as you pray to God, you feel like he, he guides you towards just joining a small group and having that weekly time and in different parts of reading that are part of it or, or watching a video that are part of that. But the important thing is that we start to, to invite God more and more into our lives. And I love the idea of what Pastor Terry shared about as, as wisdom builds a house, inviting God to, to help kind of interior design or decorate that one room of our house and then just continually inviting him into more and more of our lives. And so may God guide us in, in finding, you know, maybe one thing to, to reinforce with his word, to reinforce with practices of holiness that help us to, to set ourselves and parts of our lives apart for the things of God as we integrate him more and more into each aspect of our lives. And we're going to close out our time together with a, a song called A Rising Fire. And I'll circle back at the end with some of the things that are coming up this week that may be of interest to you. Enjoy.
mean, the, the rising of the sun each day, you know, something of the pattern of our lives point to the things of God and help us to, to remember to stay connected to him and how vitally important that is to us as we seek to, to be people of his word, people who are, are studying the things that, that he said actually mean the most in life and applying those truths to our lives so that what comes into us is what comes out of us. And, and ultimately, those are the things of, of truth and of life and of love. So just a, a few things that we wanted to remind you of this week. So tomorrow we have Faith Moments with Odalis. And these are a great time. We have those on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 8.30 a.m. And Odalis shares you know, maybe a 10 or 15 minute devotional time where she kind of goes a little bit deeper into some of God's word and some of the, the things that stand out to her in that in ways that we can seek to apply those to help us as we, we journey throughout the end of our week and into the weekend. And then we have on our Sundays, the weekend online services. So again, we have those on three platforms. We have them on Facebook, on YouTube, and on our website with live chat for each of those at nine and 11. And then uh, on each of those sites, it becomes on demand at starting at 1 p.m. as well. And then at 9 and 11, at our Reardon campus, we have an in-person time of communion. Um, we are so fortunate to have a space where we can gather outside with social distancing applied, wearing masks, but still be able to have a time of worship, to be able to share a little bit of God's word, and, and then be able to take communion together as a means of remembering not only what Jesus did through the cross for each of us so that we could be forgiven and given the promise of eternal life, but also to be mindful and intentional about remembering what he said and what he did and how that's meant to inform and impact our lives as we seek to live for him and love like him and serve those around us. So if you are feeling ready to, to come and gather, it's still permissible for us to do so uh, as long as we're outside and, and we're, we're doing what we should be doing to stay safe. So please consider joining us there. And if you haven't gotten your breakthrough wristbands, the new series on Sundays, uh, you can come to the Reardon campus and get those and then stay for communion as well. And then also wanted to mention one of the things that's coming up is we have our, our Vision Sunday on January 24th. So this will still be an online service, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. There's going to be some special parts of that where we share some of the things that are coming up this year and how we are, are seeing God moving and, and how we're going to respond to that and, and some of the things that we're very excited about with this, with this new year and the new opportunities therein. So put that in your calendar. Be sure to, to check out that weekend. Hopefully you're, you're coming every weekend, but we understand that's not always possible for us. Um, but the good thing about being online is you can always catch it later as well. But with that, have a wonderful week and we'll, we'll see you next Wednesday. God bless.